Hello and welcome to Daily Prayer Today. I'm Reverend Ochart. Glad that you are with me today. Today's scriptures come from the book of uh, the daily lectionary readings of the Reformed Common Lectionary, and they are all from the NRSV version of the Bible. Our liturgy comes from the Book of Common Worship of the Presbyterian Church USA, and that's about it. So let's go ahead and get started. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. The Lord's unfailing love and mercy never cease. Fresh is the morning and sure as the sunrise. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God of all glory, we give you thanks that through the gift of baptism we have been crucified with Christ and united with him in resurrection. By the power of your Holy Spirit, let our lives proclaim the good news that we are dead to sin and alive to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our readings for today are Psalm 57 and 145, Genesis 14, 1 through 7, and 8 through 24. So 14, 1 through 24. Second reading is Hebrews 8, 1 through 13. And the gospel reading is John 4, 43 to 54. Listen for God's word to speak to you. Psalm 57. Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me. For in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until the destroying storm passes by. I I cry to God most high, to God who fills his purpose for me. He will send from heaven and save me. He will put to shame those who trample on me. Selah. God will send forth his steadfast love and his faithfulness. I lie down among lions that greedily devour human prey. Their teeth are spears and arrows their tongues sharp swords. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. They set a net for my steps. My soul was bowed down. They dug a pit in my path, but they have fallen into it themselves. Selah. My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake, my soul. Awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is as high as the heavens. Your faithfulness extends to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. And Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall laud your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty, and on your wondrous works I will meditate. The might of your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed, and I will declare your greatness. They shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness, and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. 
All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of all who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. Genesis chapter 14. In the days of King M. Raphael of Shinar, King Arioch of Eliezer, King Shilomer of Elam, and King Tidal of Goyim. These kings made war with the King Bera of Sodom, King Bersha of Gomorrah, King Shineb of Adma, King Shemabar of Zeboim, and the King of Bela, that is Zoar. All these joined forces in the Valley of Siddim, that is the Dead Sea. Twelve years they had served Chedlomer, in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Chedlomer, the king and the kings who were with him came and subdued Rephaim in Ashroth Kernam and Zuzim in Ham, the Zuzim in Ham, the Emim in Shiva Kiriathayim, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir as far as El Paran on the edge of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishfat, that is, Kadesh, and subdued all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who lived in Hazazan Tamar. Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is, Zoar, went out, and they joined battle in the valley of Sidim with king Chedolomar of Elam, king Tidal of Goyim, King Amraphel of Shinar, and King Arioch of Eleazar. Four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim was full of bitumen pits, and as the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into them, and, they re- and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who lived in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. Then one who had escaped came and told Abram, the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre and the Amorite, brother of Eschol and of Ener, these were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his nephew had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and routed them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the goods and also brought back his nephew Lot with his goods and the women and the people. After his return from the defeat of Shedomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Siva, that is the king's valley. And King Melchizedek of Salem brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, the God by God Most High, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him one-tenth of everything. Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord, God most high, maker of heaven and earth, 
that I would not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours, so that you might not say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me, Anner, Eskel, and Mamre. Let them take their share. From Hebrews chapter 8, 1 through 13. Now, the main point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary, and the true tent that is the Lord, and not any mortal has set up. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Hence, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They offer worship in a sanctuary that is a sketch and a shadow of the heavenly one. For Moses, when he was about to erect the tent, was warned, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But Jesus has now obtained a more excellent ministry. And to that degree, he is the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted through better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need to look for a second one. God finds fault with them when he says, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their ancestors on the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I had no concern for them, says the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel for those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest." For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and growing old shall soon disappear. And John chapter 4, verses 43 to 54. When the two days were over, He went from that place to Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in the prophet's own country. When he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, since they had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the festival, for they too had gone to the festival. Then he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had had changed the water into wine. Now there was a royal official whose son lay ill in Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come from from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my little boy dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and started on his way. As he was going down, his slave met him and told him that his child was alive. So he asked them the hour when he began to recover. And they said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. The father realized that this was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. So he himself believed along with his whole household. Now this was the second sign that Jesus did after coming from Judea to Galilee. Oops. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So today's scriptures, we had um, the first psalm was kind of a psalm of penitence. uh, A psalm that, you know, you know what I have done, um, but praising God in the midst of it. Uh, Psalm 145, a great psalm of praise and joy and um, very, very thankful, um, very honoring of God. Then we have in Genesis, we have, uh, we skipped over, there was a, there's a story in between these where um, 
there was some argument between Lot and Abram. And Abram says to Lot, or the, the, the problem was that they had actually acquired so many sheep and goats and that sort of thing that their shepherds were having a hard time. They're in a place that's fairly arid. There's not a whole lot of places to, to feed flocks. And these flocks are kind of running into each other. And the shepherds are arguing, this is, this is our area where we're feeding the flocks. You need to go somewhere else. And so there's some, some argument among them. So Abram says to Lot, look to the right, to the left, look to the, to the north and the south, see where you would like to go, and I'll go whichever way you don't go. Well, Lot looks and he sees that the land around Sodom and Gomorrah, these walled cities, are, are better land, right? There's, they're more green. And so he goes and takes the better land for himself, but he's going to be kind of a, a more of a city dweller. And he kind of is slowly moving closer and closer to, the, to living in these cities which is a problem when there's this larger conflict that has been going on for now the last 14 years, we're told. Um, There were these four kings, and they were under the rule of these five kings. They had this alliance. But these four kings decide, uh, along with the king of Sodom and Gomorrah, they decide that they are not going to pay homage to this other king, Chedomir. And so they start a rebellion. They don't send any of the of the proceeds or any of the, um, I can't remember what it's called, but um, these gifts to this other king. And so King Chedolomir and his allies come and they make war against these other four kings. So there, there's this huge war between them. In the midst of this war, whether he was fighting for them or not, Lot and his household are captured. A survivor gets out and goes and tells Abram that that Lot has been kidnapped, has been captured. And Abram comes down and he has 318 men, which is not a lot of men compared to the the army of five combined city-states. And yet Abram gets victory. And we're told he, you know, he divides and he attacks at night and he routs them. Um, this is very much, we see this uh, all throughout, especially the historical section of, of the Old Testament, that God gives victory in surprising ways to, to vastly outnumbered groups. This is what happens. Abram wins this victory, gets all the, the loot, all the booty, and, and then comes out. And then we have this really interesting story, which we have been talking about in, in reference to Hebrews, where Melchizedek, this, this king of Salem or king of peace, comes out and he is a priest of the most high God. And he comes and he brings bread and wine, which is a really interesting um, sort of uh, like a communion kind of overtones to it. And Abram gives him 10% of everything that he got through this battle. And the king of Sodom says, great, take everything that you want. And Abram says, no, 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 no. you take it back. Because I don't want anyone to say that I made Abram rich. So Abram is starting to get there, right? Abram is saying, I don't want to be rich because of what you have done. I want to be rich because God has shown victory. Um, or presumably that's what it is. He is he has just seen that God can give victory to even 318 guys against this large army. <clears throat> and so he doesn't want to trust in this other king. He wants to put his trust in the living God. And he worships God there with Melchizedek, this priest of the Most High God. Really interesting um, section, right? Then we have in Hebrews uh, a, a continuation of this idea that, that we now have this new covenant. Um, it's a new and a better covenant. It doesn't mean that the old covenant, the Old Testament, is not good, but it was not perfect. It was not the, the best that it could be. It was for a purpose. It had a particular um, purpose, right? God has instituted this new covenant through Jesus. And we see sort of a, a shadow of this new covenant in the old t- covenant. Um, priests used to serve and, and pray to God on behalf of the people and make sacrifices on behalf of the people in this tabernacle, this tent of meeting that was made into a temple, a, a physical or, well, the tabernacle was also physical, but a permanent structure or, or permanent structures. 
And all of them were supposed to be based on this very precise dimensions. And the author of Hebrews is arguing that those dimensions are the actual throne room of the living God. Um, that they were based on something that actually exists in heaven. And Jesus, this, this guarantor of this new covenant, is a priest for us, praying on our behalf, making sacrifice, has made a sacrifice on our behalf, is our high priest, not in this sketch, this uh, you know shadow of temple, but in the true temple, the very presence of the living God. Not that those other things were bad, but that this is even better. And God has laid out this better covenant for us to, to be a part of. And so we should be doing so. Then we have in John, we have Jesus going, continuing on to, um, to Galilee. And it's interesting the, the looking at the difference. So in Samaria, he is received with open arms. He is welcomed in Galilee with his own people. He's like, oh yeah, it's that guy. Great. You know, oh nice, he's back. And that's about it. He doesn't do anything overly miraculous. He does heal the the child of this man who is a royal official. And presumably this is someone in Herod's court, part of the um um part of the civil authority that has been instituted by uh, by Rome. He comes to Jesus and says, I want you to heal my child. And Jesus says, you guys, you're just asking for signs and you won't actually believe. He says, I believe that you're going to. So Jesus says, fine, go. He's already healed. And this guy goes away and he believes. He believes that Jesus has healed his son, even though he didn't see him. And he gets word from one of his servants that, in fact, his son was healed at that exact same time. Pretty cool. Let's go ahead and join together in prayer. Satisfy us with your love in the morning, and we will live this day in joy and praise. Mighty God of mercy, we thank you for the resurrection dawn, bringing the glory of our risen Lord, who makes every day new. Especially we thank you for the mission and ministry of the church. every service that proclaims your love. The people and relationships that sustain us. our calling to daily discipleship. Signs of new life and hope. People of God, for what else do we give thanks? Merciful God of might, renew this weary world, heal the hurts of all your children, and bring about your peace for all in Christ Jesus, the living Lord. Especially we pray for the Church of Jesus Christ in every land. The stewardship and healing of creation. friends, and family members. Neighbors in special need. All who serve your mission in the world. People of God, for what else do we pray?
Lord God, I lift up to you, Dennis and Donna, um, for their continued work and, and, and their continued grief over the loss of Dennis's mother. We pray that you would continue to be with them and keep them. Eternal God, our beginning and our end, be our starting point and our haven, and accompany us in this day's journey. Use our hands to do your creation, and use our lives to bring others the new life you give this world in Jesus Christ, Redeemer of all. Amen. Now let's continue to pray using the words that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Now the grace of God be with us all, now and always. Amen. Bless the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Thank you so much for joining me today for daily prayer. Join me tomorrow for some more. Uh, Like this video and share it with someone else. Also, subscribe if you have not done so already and click the notification button. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you later.